Friends, good evening. Welcome to the National Opera Center. I'm Mark Skorka. I'm president of Opera America, and it is nice to see you here. And then we have over 300 people who are joining us by live stream for this program. I think everyone is very curious to learn more about Chevalier the film and Le Chevalier the artist. Um, it is really uh, amazing to see the movie and to learn more about this incredible man, Joseph Bologna, the <coughs> Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He was uh, born in 1745 in Guadeloupe. That is 11 years before Mozart. Uh, he was taken to France at the age of seven by his father to study, and he became, as you will learn, prominent as a great violinist, conductor, composer, fencing master, and many other things if you dig into the material. Marie Antoinette was one of his admirers. He knew Haydn and Salieri. He also knew uh, Beaumarchais, if you remember, who wrote the plays The Marriage of Figaro and The Barber of Seville that we know so well. And like Beaumarchais, he joined in the support of the American Revolution and later fought for liberty in France in the 1790s. He died in 1799, interestingly, the same year that Beaumarchais died. Uh, that was some years after the death of Mozart and of the Queen of France. Uh, the film tells the story of his life with equal emphasis on his tremendous accomplishments and also the prejudice that he faced as a mixed race, illegitimate child of a colonial French aristocrat. The film is deeply instructive, and I think it also is inspiring to learn more about this great composer and his music. Uh, this evening, we're going to begin to learn more. We have three really outstanding guests. Uh, Marlon Daniel is the foremost authority on the life and music of Joseph Bologna. Among his many credits, he is artistic and music director of the Festival, Festival International de Musique Saint-Georges. Uh, Charles Vincent Burwell is a tremendously accomplished composer and lyricist. His operetta by George will premiere next month in just about two weeks at Lamp Lamplighter's Music Theater in San Francisco. And finally, we have Joe Neumeyer, who's a noted film critic, currently for New York's 710 AM WOR Radio. So without any further ado, please welcome Marlon, Vince, and Joe. Come on in. Welcome, welcome. Please uh, have a seat. How are you doing? So good to see you again. Welcome. Please, thanks for being here. Please. The, uh, I saw the movie last night, and uh, it's playing at Lincoln Center and around New York, so you can see it. I'm just so glad that we're here to talk about it. I wanted to ask each of you how you first came to know about Joseph Bologna. What, what was the path that got you to uh, know about this incredible person? I'm going to start with you, Vince. Oh, well. Um, well, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, a while ago, uh, I think it was my third, our third show, me and my writing partner, James D. Sasser, who's, who's out here, um, uh, we were looking for our next piece, and we began, we were looking at uh, the story of uh, Thomas Alexander Dumas, um, mm -hmm. the father of, the father of uh, Alexander mm -hmm. Dumas, the famous writer. And um, it was a special time in France, and we were introduced to uh, Chevalier um, through his uh, tutelage in, in fencing of uh, Alexander Dumas. And the more that we read about this, this person, this, this amazing figure, um, James and I got into it about, well, I want to write about Chevalier. <laughs> so we said, well, next show. And so doing the deep dive on that, and I'm like, and I heard the theme, the thematic material. And I've, I've heard these themes before. I've heard this music before. And, um, and then I realized, oh, I've heard Mozart. So mm -hmm. <laughs> some of it might be there, um, suspiciously. But, um, but I'd heard the music before, but I didn't know the story or the human behind it. I didn't know that he was a person of color. Um, and so it was really exciting to, to do a deep dive onto this person as a, as a, as a figure because, uh, you know, uh, they say art imitates life, but, uh, but he's an extraordinary, his story is so extraordinary. And 
coincidentally, it was a story that we are just finding out about, yeah. which speaks to more to who he was and what he represented at the time. And what is amazing is how interconnected the whole history of France and of the literary, political, artistic leaders. So uh, Chevalier, uh, Joseph Bologna, was the fencing instructor for Alexandre Dumas, who is the father. The father. Uh, because it was the son who wrote the play, of course, in which we have the La Traviata. Mm -hmm. So just an amazing connection uh, through these multiple talents. Well, and how did you first come to know about Joseph Bologna? Well, I have been performing um, Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de Saint George, since 1996. Um, I was one of the first of my colleagues to be performing his works in public. Um, I found out about him through a colleague who was working with the French government tourism. And, um, and they told me about this incredible story about a composer who influenced Mozart, who was of color. Um, my immediate response is, I don't believe you. I've never read about this. I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. I've never known it because there's so few role models of color and people of color in classical music and at that time, even less. Now we're having a very big insurg insurgence of it. And, um, and you felt alone. And this made me feel really part and connected to this world of classical music that I have been having a career in. Was it hard in 1996 to find the music to perform? Yes, I was uncovering one piece at a time. And um, you know, first you, know, you find out about them, and then you start searching and you start looking at history and finding out about things like that. And in 2011, I had the first uh, incarnation of the Festival International Music Saint Georges in Guadeloupe, in the hometown place of where his birth was. And that was just like going to the Mecca and you know being baptized again. And is his music readily available today? Where did you have to, what publisher, where did you have to find it's it? It's not readily available, all of it. But some you can find on IMSLP, and people have been publishing things and going to finding pieces in the Paris Library. And it's even as far as Vienna, like his string quartets opus 14 are actually in the Vienna Library. Mm -hmm. And so little by little people have been uncovering them putting them on IMSLP, and one of the really side things of the festival, and the Association Festival International Music Saint George, is to actually um, republish them. Mm -hmm. um, like I have parts to most of the concertos and give parts to them. Some of them are edited and most of them have like, if you would call them critical editions, I mean we all have our degrees right. and things like that. So we are bringing them out for the public. So when they finally make the Saint George Library, or what you're probably called the Joseph Bologna Library in Guadalupe, right. um, they will have a stock of material for people to come. How fantastic. Use. That's great. Yeah. Joe, was, was reviewing the film your first introduction? <clears throat> It certainly was. In fact, uh, I remember a couple of years ago when I read First in Variety or, or you know, The Hollywood Reporter or something, uh, since it's my business to know all of that stuff, uh, read when it was sort of going into production, and then I filed that away. Years go by, I never really need to get, need it again. And then uh, when I saw the film, I did a, just a quick little research on it. I knew I was going to be uh, seeing it, and, and but I didn't quite know what it was going to be about. So I did a, a quick search on the internet to see, not too much, because I don't like to know too much about a film before I go into it. I want it to surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so seeing this film, which obviously is what the, the filmmakers in the studio uh, want it to be, which is it introduced uh, this amazing story to, uh, to my eyes, uh, completely out of whole cloth. And I can only imagine the, the level of satisfaction through artistry and scholarship, knowing his music and knowing his life story. Uh, but it came to me, yes, uh, almost completely originally through the, uh, through the film. I'm going to stay with you for a second, Joe, then I'm going to ask our other two guests the same question. In all that you came to learn, a little bit before and through the film and perhaps even a little bit after the film, what is the aspect of Chevalier saint George's life that most surprised you? I think the self-invention and the determination that I think is is present in the film, and obviously is a is a driving force of the of the narrative arc of it, but but is certainly I'm sure there in in the man's life story uh, itself the the sort of sense of um, creating himself for himself and and creating a, a place for himself where he where he knew his talents, his artistry, and his uh, his personality would come forth. I think there's there's lots of different ways to tackle lots of different stories. And I think that the thing that surprised me the most or that was really, um, really interesting 
was his his sense of of self invention in a lot of ways and finding the ways to to bring out uh, every aspect of himself the fencing the the uh, the composing the the, the musicianship um, the uh, the romantic side all of that stuff so but the self self creation was the interesting thing and certainly in the film at least that valedictory from his father yeah. on leaving yeah. him off at the school yes. which is you know look you you are different from the rest of the people yeah. at this school and you're just going to have to be excellent you know yes. just whatever you do you have to be excellent and yeah. you get the sense that he just carried that that through his life yeah yeah what's the line they say that uh, no one can can fault an excellent frenchman uh, mm -hmm. i think is the line yes. to paraphrase no, in the film yeah something like that mm -hmm. exactly i think i just found that fascinating and really interesting Carl, how about for you, of thinking about all you know about this man, this composer, this artist, what, what's the aspect that most captivates you? Well, I would say also the resilience and creativity. Um, at this time, it's like there's it's no secret that when you are put in a situation and you are actually a person who's different, that uh, you know all black parents tell their child, you know, you have to be 10 times as better. You have to do that. And he was one of those people who were, uh, Esther, I think, quote, Walter Smith was a superman of his time. He became excellent at everything he d d did because he was forced to. And I think that that was a part of the resilience. It's part of survival. Because if he was not excellent at everything he was doing, we would not be talking about him today. Vince? All of this, yes, definitely. Um, I have to, I, in our introduction to his life through Alexander Dumas, he was also an extraordinary person. So there are a lot of parallels between these, these, these individuals and these gentlemen be, because they had to be, because they were different, as, as you've said. Um, there's a social and a mental gymnastics that goes along with that. So we talk about his virtuosity as a swordsman. We talk about his virtuosity as a, viol uh, a violinist and a composer, and, and, and he was a multi-hyphenate before it became Instagrammable, right? So I, want, I, I look at all of the things that had to go on up here to do that, the gymnastics that you had to do to move in the highest societies of a world that, well, to borrow from the, from the movie, that you're a tourist in. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot. It's, it's, an, it's a lot to be good at your craft, but being good socially so that you can Make sure that you are where you need to be. Need to be. Make the friends that you need to make. Hold on to them. Hold. Mm -hmm. Use these. You know, barter these relationships for currency, um, social currency. That is difficult. We we know that that's difficult in today in, in today's day and age. So seeing how he was able to do that, so that he is somebody that we can even know about now, is is really quite extraordinary. Marlon, I I let you know in advance, I'll, and Vince will probably ask you the same question. The the film could not possibly capture every episode and every bit of his life. I mean, it's, it's an hour and 47 minutes, an hour and 47 minutes. So things had to be either left on the cutting room floor uh, or just left out entirely. Yes. Is there some aspect of his life that was left out that you wish made it into the movie? It's, uh, the, the movie's a little bit of a collage, I would say in that sense, um, and they end right where I really wanted it to begin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in one hour and 47 minutes, I was felt like I could have used an extra half an hour or so. <laughs> um, because they ended the movie. And has everybody seen the movie here? Probably, there hasn't been a whole lot of not, movie. Not a lot of people, Highland. yet some people. Okay, well, so, so. well, when it starts with the French Revolution, as I think when things start really getting interesting, mm -hmm. And, um, and people start getting the guillotine. And, um, and uh, for me, I like more realistic things that <laughs> happen, and not one person got the guillotine. I was like, oh, darn it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you, we, there were a few who would. <laughs> we know they are who they are, and who, when they got it, the, the guillotine. So that's so interesting. Yeah. So just give us a little bit more, because mm -hmm. um, indeed, I mean, he has a very distinguished mm -hmm. uh, career uh, up in northeastern France, protecting the French Revolution from those who yes. would invade and stop it. 1789. Right? Yes. And uh, he's, he led the, fir the, 
the, the, the regiment of the French army that was an all black or, mm -hmm. or all mixed race. The Legion de Saint-Georges. Saint tell tell and, us uh, about, um, a little bit about that. Well, as so I said, of course, when Saint-Georges, he was the greatest fencer in France. And so being the greatest fencer and being a nobleman, he attracted many people who wanted to be like him, even at that time, um, including Thomas Alexander Dumas. Uh, and so this is really important. He collected the most aristocratic, the most working class. Everybody wanted to be led by Saint-Georges. And he led them to victory every time. Mm -hmm. And this was very, you know, they were all wanting to prove that nothing, you know, could be better than a, a great Frenchman. And so they wanted to be French. They just didn't want to be from wherever they were, from Africa or whatever, because at the time between in and outs of Napoleon, you in France, slavery did not exist. So it was a constant pressure to prove that you were French and not a slave or not from somewhere else. So I think that that had a lot to do with it. Now, even you know, after the film, which, <laughs> yeah. the film's over, yeah. uh, because he served very notably mm -hmm. uh, in defense of France, mm -hmm. but his aristocratic birth mm -hmm. and his friendships at court yes. did leave him under a cloud in the 1790s. Oh, being friends with uh, Philippe de Orléans. Yeah. And, um, and of course, being uh, in, the, in the court of Marie Antoinette. Um, that was one of the things that would get your head cut off. And uh, <laughs> when, they're, when they're talking about e egalité mm -hmm. and all of the things that make French, the French at the time, at the time of the French Revolution, and which led, of course, to the time of terror. You know, this is the things that would get you, you dead quickly, your books burn, and everything like that, which all of these things kind of happened to him. Um, I think the, him being an aristocrat and being a knight uh, and being in the court it was one of the negative things that people saw him as being that way. They want to get their out for blood. Everybody's not exempt. However, I think the one thing that did save him, that he was fighting for egalité, really, really mm -hmm. was. He believed in those things, mm -hmm. and those values. And he, everyone had to believe him because he was a mulatto. He was of mixed race. His mother was of African descent. Mm -hmm. And so this is the thing that I think that most of all saved them. They tried, but they figured that basically if you try to do this, you're like cutting your hand off to or your nose off to right. spike your right. face. Right. Right. When did he know, when did he teach Alexandre Dumas uh, fencing? Well, as a noble and as a, as a, as a person of African descent, Many people uh, wanted to be under his tutelage. And uh, Chevalier uh, de, de saint George, uh, Joseph Bologna, had the choice of who he wanted to, to work with. And he chose, um, chose Alexander Dumas partially because of the, 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 the similarities and the relationships that they had, um, but also to help prepare him to move towards the, the military career because mm -hmm. Alexander Dumas, now I'm going into the uh, Alexander Dumas, uh, Tomai Alexander Dumas story, uh, he lived the good life for a while. Mm -hmm. And so, as the Chevalier did, and so understanding how to manage court. So this was a young Alexander Dumas and a, maybe a decade older uh, Chevalier mm -hmm. um, bestowing the tutelage of how he should move through court so that he didn't end up in dire straits or in trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, but could move up as well as how to sort. So it was, so it was, a, it was a mentorship that existed on two levels. Mm -hmm. So a 20-something um, Alexander Dumas, 30-something Chevalier. So um, if we think about what was left out in the film, one thing that was left out was Alexandre Dumas, who might have been a character or, or one of the guests at one of those parties. Well, that well, would have happened definitely then. <laughs> well, they cut it. <laughs> but obviously, the stories are so large. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't, and that's the thing about adaptation or about, about doing his, historic work um, as a writer. Uh, it's hard to condense any of our stories into two hours, much less figures. Um, my life has been interesting, but it has not been just <laughs> <laughs> so, so trying to figure out what's going to, where do you want this to go, and how to cut it off, because as you're saying, well, the, the things got so interesting mm -hmm. after the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, very, it's like got very complicated. Um, yes. And then the movie was Peachy, mm -hmm. which, and yeah. we know, uh, Peachy 13, maybe. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And we PG. know how, you know, it's France. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. God. So, in terms of, and we said this in our, in our call on Friday, and I didn't put it on 
on my list here. Because it's a movie, they're trying to tell a good story. And perhaps we mentioned that the, the movie Amadeus isn't actually surgically accurate about the life of Mozart. It is the life of Mozart. And it's also told in a way that makes it a good movie. Of course. Was there an inaccuracy about the movie that was your pebble in the shoe on the way home? Um, there were so many things that they took liberty with. Um, when I go to the theater, I like to see a good movie. Um, no, no matter what it is, and so they've put things in different orders a little bit, they did things, but uh, one of the things that I thought, and I looked around, was I thought was one of the really moving things that never happened, that you haven't seen the movie, so maybe I shouldn't no tell you. you know, no, no spoilers here. But what I was just going to say, the, 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 the reuniting with his mother, mm -hmm. uh, which didn't quite happen mm -hmm. that way. Uh, but I found that, and a lot of people found that very touching, mm -hmm. and I thought that that was really a good point in the movie, really great movie making in that sense. And even if I knew the history, I was like, well, I believe that. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, because if you, if everyone, uh, a fan of uh, Wikipedia and things like that, the mother and the father and the wife and the daughter, they all came over on the same boat yeah, together. Yeah, they seemed to be a kind of happy family. They, yeah, they <laughs> did seem to be, you know, wife and mistress. They are, this is France. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, they all came over together, so basically, and if you, once you step on the, your feet on French soil, the metropole at the time, you were free regardless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if you weren't free before, you were free. If you got there, you were free. So the thing of her, you know, her being free later and coming back and her reunion, reunited with her right. son was ultimately touching, but ultimately not true. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't realize that yeah. too. So, Okay, I want to turn for a second to the work you've created for Lamplighters. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, it's an original piece, but it's so interesting for me that it's, in a, it's a, an opera about a composer by a composer. <laughs> and, and, you know, do you use uh, Le Chevalier's music? Do you use your own music? Is it your music based on Le Chevalier's? Is it a mix? How do you, as a composer, write an opera about a composer? I've actually never thought about it quite like that. <laughs> um, uh, it's my music, so it's, it's completely original. And so it has the hallmarks of my music. And those, if you know my work, I write in a number of different genres. So, but there are certain consistencies that you'll see that are Vince-isms. Um, so those are there. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's a classical score. It's a classical periodically score. So. Baroque, classical, mm -hmm. romantic. So it's it's in the it's in the the classical uh, Baroque elements, classical elements. Um, <clears throat> and I I you'll hear some thematic, some leitmotif, some thematic material that is Chevalier and uh, or uh, Joseph Bologna and uh, Joseph Esque. Mm -hmm. But it's primarily my music and and and, and or our world music and the way that we wanted to envision telling our story. So in works like this, the music is also functional too. And so we want to make sure that we tell the story that we want to tell in a way that um, works with our manner of storytelling. Um, I didn't want to go too deep into Chevalier's repertoire because frankly, it's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. He's a very virtuosic uh, 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 violinist and I didn't want to have to put that, I didn't want to write it and then have to put that on somebody to play mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I don't play the guy in violin. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it was really interesting getting into the mindset of this character and, 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 or this human as a character. Um, and I need to be careful not to, to mix the two. Mm -hmm. um, are telling the story because we wanted to make sure that we didn't tell a story that's rooted in black pain. Mm -hmm. Because, and that's one of the things that I like about the movie in that it did stop mm -hmm. at a certain point because past that point, because life gets very complicated and there's a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. um, so it's light. Um, mm -hmm. If we are looking at fact and fact and fiction, it is quite fiction. Um, mm -hmm. but, it is a, but, but looking at the movie now, I'm looking at how similar the storylines are because it's a storyline of any composer, mm -hmm. particularly a composer of opera or, or, or performance, uh, music for performance. We, James and I joke, we spend more of our time really trying to find money, raise money, than <laughs> actually writing. Yeah. So there are elements of the story that are similar. Yeah. 
And, and the opera is called By George. By George. A Day in the Life of. A Day in the Life of Chevalier. And um, it, is it actually the story of a day, a, compli a, a complicated day, or? Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and how did you connect with Lamplighters to do this? How did they find you or you find them for this piece? Uh, an artist that, uh, a wonderful uh, 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 performer that uh, we know, uh, that I know through James, my writing partner, um, had mentioned us to the Lamplighters. Uh, this gentleman had done work with the Lamplighters before and said, hey, you know, I've got, uh, I think they spoke, uh, Cheryl spoke to this person about an idea and we were recommended. And, um, and they took a big risk on us because this is the first time that they've commissioned a work. Exactly. It is a Gilbert and Sullivan company. Mm -hmm. And, and it, is it the first time they have done something other than Gilbert and Sullivan? And a commission. I well, believe so. I think so on both I believe on both so. Counts. And so, and that's another yeah. thing that, uh, another point. We wanted to maintain the link between the work of Gilbert and Sullivan and our story. So it does have Gilbert Sullivan references and isms too, so that it's told in an operetta style that is reminiscent of Gilbert and Sullivan, so that, there's, that we're able to stay close to their mission as well as, as, as evolving it and moving it forward a bit. In preparing for all of this work and study, even on the work around uh, Alexandre Dumas, mm -hmm. did you explore the music of uh, Joseph Bologna? And did you listen to quartets? To yeah. uh, what did you? What do you think of the music? Like I said, it's hard. It's <laughs> um, it's it's one. It's beautiful because the the music is so beautiful, and and the things that we equate with Mozart with Haydn. You hear it in a, in a way that every artist, is, every composer, everybody's a little bit different. And his music soars in a way that, that really touched me. And so that's what I tried to keep. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, the, I referenced his, the concerto. You know, obviously, there's not, a, there's not a wide body of work that's available for us. So there's references to his concerto number nine before. So, and so I listen to it, and it, 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 it helps me tell the story that I want to tell about him. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that comes through. Joe, I want to ask you about film criticism. Is when you think about uh, critiquing a new opera, frequently the music critic has libretto, the score. The uh, music critic may have interviewed the composer and librettist. In some instances, the music critic may go to a rehearsal. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it happens. Um, how does a film critic prepare to review a film? That's a terrific question. And I, and I, first of all, I would just like to say, I, in a film like this, I would recommend everybody to talk to Marlon and Vince before or after, because what I'm learning about the film from listening to these two gentlemen uh, not only makes me want to see the things that they excised from the film or that didn't make it into the cut, but also uh, it's it's just fascinating in, in so many ways. Um, one of the things that I like to do before before I see a film is I I want to I want to go in fresh, but like I mentioned earlier, I want to make sure that I. Uh, have some, I know the world, the arena that it's in, I know the, the basic template of the scaffolding of the story as it were. Sometimes it's terrific to go in and just be completely surprised. But especially for, for a biopic, for lack of a better word, or a film that's based on, a, on an actual figure, I want to know a little bit more. Um, one, one side note is that, because uh, Vince mentioned that, and obviously Lamplighters being a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, related company, this film in some ways, uh, it had, you know, there's echoes of Amadeus, but, I, but I, it also reminded me of Topsy Turvy, the Mike Lee film about Gilbert and Sullivan in a lot of ways. It also reminded me of a, of a film that I remember liking a lot from 1991 called Impromptu about yes. Chopin, uh, yes. that's directed by James Lapine. Yeah. And where, it, it's, and it's about Chopin and, and George Sand, and it's sort of this, so in a lot of ways, one of the, the I interviewed the filmmaker for this. Um, subsequent to, to reviewing it, uh, I interviewed him for a film festival, um, Stephen Williams. And one of the things that he said is that he did not want to do uh, a hagiography, just a complete cradle to grave film. And so there are elements to it that are, that are kind of hodgepodge together, um, including the opening where there's sort of, sort of this duel between Mozart and, uh, and Joseph Bologna that is, that is inspired. A violin duel. Oh yes, a violin. Yes, that's, that's important when you're talking about violin. Somebody who's a violinist and a fencer. That's right. um, 
And so that he's on stage, and, and, and he said the inspiration for that came from, there's a uh, possibly apocryphal story of how um, uh, Cream was, uh, was performing on stage at some point in the late 60s, and, uh, and Eric Clapton allowed uh, Jimi Hendrix, who's not quite Jimi Hendrix yet, to come up on stage. Uh, and, and he said, sure, come on up. <laughs> Hendrix, of course, shredded and, and, and did an incredible job, and Clapton went behind, again, supposedly went behind to his manager and said, who the hell was that guy? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Stephanie Robinson, the the screenwriter, and Stephen Williams, the director, thought that something like that to introduce the the notion of what this rivalry and and this sort of this this uh, this dialogue, this musical dialogue between Mozart and uh, and Bologna would be that would sort of be a good way to, to go into it. And knowing things like that beforehand sometimes can, if you're reviewing a film, can 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 alter your your viewing experience, mm -hmm. and it can, it can get into your faculties in some ways that you're saying, this, from what I read, this isn't right. Now, if one knows of that story, that's a different thing. But I think for most audiences and most critics, um, you're kind of wanting to kind of get a little hooked by the story, and then you'll hopefully go and, and learn more about it, as the, the phrase goes for the kids. Uh, kids uh, you said earlier kids, that yeah. you like when a movie surprises yes, you. Yes, I do, yeah. Um, so you really do like going quite Quite unprepared, if yeah. you will, yeah. uh, so that you can really take it in as a first experience. That's right, that's right. And if it's something that I know already, uh, you know, obviously I have that knowledge. But it's something I don't know, I want it to sort of, I want it to treat me in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that, that respects the, the intelligence of its audience, but it is also um, sort of telling you something new or something that's, it's, it's, you know, what is filmmaking but saying, look, sit down, let me tell you a story. And I'm going to tell you to you in pictures and in music and cinematography and costume design, all of which, by the way, is phenomenal in this film. I really like the film, but I think that so many of those uh, what's called below the line elements, the costume design, the production design, uh, set design, all of that, uh, the performances are all terrific. And, and Kelvin Harrison Jr., who plays uh, Bologna, did all of his own bowing and all of his own fencing. None of that is sort of faked. Really? Ways. Yeah. So that, I thought, was interesting, and I think sort of adds to the verisimilitude of the film. And I think that reviewing a film like this requires a little bit of acknowledging, at least to the reader, look, this was new to me, or I did not know this aspect of this historical figure, but perhaps like me, you're interested in it, or you will be intrigued to learn more. And here's how it works on a narrative sense, as a film, beyond the, the, the facts of the, mm -hmm. of the man's life, mm -hmm. you know, or, the, or the life that you're examining. So you've heard us talking about the man, a little bit about the musician. Um, and what came after the film. From a point of view of watching a film, what, what do you suggest you know, our audience who's not seen the film should look for, or tell me all the things I should have looked for and missed. So uh, what, what through the film critic's eye should we look for in the film? I mean, it's a, it's a performance medium, of course. So first off, I would say uh, the, the, the performances, the acting performances, and the, and the musicianship is terrific. The score by, uh, by Chris Bowers is wonderful, but the performances by Kelvin Harrison is terrific. Uh, Lucy Boynton, who plays Marie Antoinette, uh, is a lot of fun, and there's sort of there's a there's a sense to the film of um, of it almost reminded me in some ways of Barry Lyndon of the Kubrick film. Barry Lyndon's shot a lot of natural light. There's sort of a sense of of you're being immersed in this world. They didn't want to do a lot of editing into shots. They wanted to keep sort of long shots or have the scenes kind of play off a little bit to help you be in that moment a little bit. So I would say look for that. Look for that aspect of of the um, of the scenes of the rhythm of the film drawing you in, uh, a sense of the tension, of, and also the, um, you know, the, the sense of, um, there's a, you, you're sort of swathed in this, in this beautiful, in these beautiful estates, the beautiful costumes, all of that. You really do feel as if you are there, and to listen to that music in the film, almost as if you are hearing it for the first time, uh, you know, in the court of Marie Antoinette, or, or in, the, in a concert hall, and hearing that music for the first time, because obviously you often are, and while, it may not be Bologna's music, it is certainly drawing you in and getting you into mm -hmm. that world. So I would say look out for that. Yeah. Enjoy it. And it's one of the things we've been talking about you know, backstage is how much of Bologna's music is or is not in the movie. And um, stay for the credits because as the cast and all the credits are going up, you will hear you know, unadulterated music of the Chevalier Saint Georges. But the rest of it mostly is by another composer, yes. uh, which yeah. is a, just an interesting choice. That's why I was asking you about the operetta and how much music you do or do not is all your music, even though it's about a composer. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, St. George's life was tumultuous. 
uh, he was uh, mixed race, he was illegitimate, uh, he was um, a celebrity artist, but always one of the dichotomies in Mozart's life, he was this celebrity child prodigy, but when he became an adult, he was going in the servant's entrance and eating at the servant's dining room table. So here you have Saint-Georges, who was both a, an accomplished musician, but musicians in the day were also just part of the servant family, but he was an aristocrat given his birth, uh, illegitimate aristocrat, so just all these conflicts. And even as he is lionized, he is also vilified because of his race and his illegitimacy. So um, I, I'm fascinated by that tension and how you understand that tension in his life. And then I'll ask you another question for after the film. How, do you feel the film deals honestly with that tension between his celebrity and the degree to which he was a victim of bigotry? Actually, that's one of the points I think the film did deal with in a very light touch. And I, and I, I, I actually appreciated that. Um, but we have to realize that Saint-Georges, or Joseph Boulogne, as they say in France, and also in Guadeloupe, um, is, was knighted. He was one of the greatest, he was a celebrity by all accounts. So that helped him in society, but then the detriments of it, him being mixed race, and with the Napoleon and the Cote Noir, and you know, the whole idea of, you know, France, you know, they brought back slavery twice. Mm -hmm. um, so that, but he had a lot of things that were going from in a positive direction, but he was loved by his, his father, obviously. You know, and, and I think that that went a long ways for his life to keep him going. And he did find love, but then he found the obstacle of not being able to be married and things like that, according to laws. And so, in a way, he was very much um, a kind of abolitionist because of the just nature of the way he was born, being born. He was born. So, you know, he had to be an activist. He had to fight. Um, he probably didn't want to. He just wanted to live his life. Yeah. The, the, um is one of the, at least as I have read it, one of the kind of inaccuracies is the film suggests that his father left him nothing, but his father actually did leave him, yes. leave him yes. a, a, a certainly a, a living stipend yes. in, in his will. He was on, he had like an allowance, mm -hmm. like most people who were of aristocratic standing and who were wealthy. So that was one of the things that, you know, but that was a dramatiz dramatization that made you know, and him being distraught at the very time his mother shows up. So that was one of those things that I think that's one of those liberties that helped the story, right. and made you feel something for And the, the story character. of the film as, exactly. as well as a, as a exactly. narrative. Now, um, Napoleon and Saint-Georges. Uh, the uh, Saint-Georges dies in 1799, but it's not long after that that his obscurity is actually accelerated by Napoleon. What happened? Well, well, of course, you know, there's the, the story that, of course, Napoleon did not like saint George at all. But Napoleon didn't like a lot of things. I mean, <laughs> you know, let's, let's face it. Uh, Beethoven, Including borders. Okay, well, those borders were not words. You know, what's yours is mine, what's mine is mine. <laughs> um, but, you know, even like, you know, other composers like Beethoven, you know, the original Third Symphony, mm -hmm. of course, was supposed to be the Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. But as he changed from being a person of the people to a tyrant, many people also changed their minds about what he stood for. And so that was one of the things that I think that's very, very significant in the life of someone who is mixed race and who, who is of uh, other descent besides being actually, you know, Caucasian in France at the time. Now, did Napoleon and Saint George know one another? Actually, they had to meet because of the military. Sure, um, and uh, and he was actually sent on missions in Napoleon's name, and so he was a defender of France. So you ha you had to, but you know Napoleon's paranoid. Anybody who becomes too popular, too high, you know, there only can be one, and that's why he became an emperor in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. He didn't, you know. <clears throat> Now, I have read, it may not be accurate, that was in 1802, Napoleon sort of bans the music of Saint-Georges and that it, it becomes, he's persona non grata and the music kind of disappears as a result. Uh, it, well, Napoleon banned a lot of things. 
<laughs> we're talking about, you know, France has gone from the city of light to the, you know, the city of terror. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was not, you know, it's like a, a, a McCarthyism. People were turning people in left and right. If you weren't with him, you were against him. If you're not my friend, you're mm -hmm. my enemy. So I don't think that he, uh, Sancho was probably one of the people who was a free thinker and had his music, but he banned a lot of people at the time. And I think just at the time with France, Paris is burning. They burned everything. Everybody who had was an aristocrat, they took their whole house, they burned it down, everything inside. And many of these people had music with St. George. I don't know if it was a dedicated strike, mm -hmm. but for sure mm -hmm. it was included. Mm -hmm. So do we know that there is a considerable amount of music by St. George that we don't have? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. We probably only probably have half of what actually is recorded. And I would have loved to hear a clarinet concerto by St. George. That I would have loved to hear, um, because there's so many similarities between Mozart and Saint George, and, uh, and what the takeaway that Mozart took away um, in uh, 1778. Yes, the takeaway. He, um, you know, what people don't realize is that everyone gives all the credit to the classical period, to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's mm -hmm. Mozart and all the gang, but a lot of those techniques and things like that were very prevalent in France. And, you know, and without St. George, if we did not have St. George to this day, if nobody found any works of him and they were all burned, France would have no representation in the classical period, mm -hmm. worth anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very big thing because we give it all to Mozart and the, all the Austrian and German composers when France had a really big stake in it. If you wanted to be anybody in the, in the world at the time, you had to come to the City of Light to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what Mozart tried to do and was not very successful. Yeah. Yeah. Vince, did you wind up listening to some of St. George's operas uh, in preparing for your operetta? Uh, I began listening to, to uh, one, and I stayed with his concertos. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I get more compositional. I got more for what I needed compositionally from my story, from, from, from mm -hmm. his concertos, from than his I concertos. did from his okay. operas. Um, and that tends to be the case, because uh, for me, because I listen to the music, um, like when I think of, say, completely different direction of Porgy and Bess, I listened to what Gershwin was doing and how Gershwin, mm -hmm. and if I'm honest, there were a couple of gershwin moments at the top of the score, at the top of the, some of the violin parts that were, that were bluesy, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and for the story, and then it comes back when we go into the story of his mother, there, so those are breadcrumbs, and so that's the storytelling. Yeah. Um, but in terms of uh, what I listen to, I really primarily stayed in the concertos. Great. Yeah. And I, I do think the film also did minimize how much he was an important conductor. Mm -hmm. And yes. that he became the conductor for Le Concert des Amateurs, yes. uh, for Le Concert Olympique, when it was yes. reformed. And in that capacity, they commissioned Haydn symphonies. And it was, he, he was also an impresario in all, yes. in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, it really is, is, is remarkable. So I want you to imagine going to imagine here, that uh, we get to, it's like uh, the film My Dinner with Andre. I want it yeah. to be the dinner between Mozart and Chevalier Saint-Georges. What would they be talking about? What do you think they'd be talking about? Vince? This is, so I'm looking at the <laughs> writing partner because this is, this is kind of funny because, um, so our show of um, referencing Alexander Pop, uh, two miles under the mile, and then this mm -hmm. one by George, um, are part of a, a a set of three shows, and this is actually in the ballpark of what our third set. Really? <laughs> 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 so I'm thinking, how much do I want to put on record? <laughs> we haven't written it yet. Um, so, uh, but what what's an idea that might come up? I think that there, I think that there, it would be a level of contention because Mozart. Is accustomed, and this is this is known. Uh, the personality of Mozart, which is unique for uh, people of this period, the personality of Mozart is known almost as much as his music is. Mm -hmm. now, some of that has to do with Amadeus and the way that they portrayed him because of art. Mm -hmm. you know. um, but um, but I would think that it would be contentious because they are so different, and because prodigies don't always play well together, mm -hmm. and. Um, and being leader of your own situation, you know, being being prodigious and from different countries, I think that there would be they're competitive. 
Okay. Um, and I think that it would fall along like the levels of social class mm -hmm. because the elephant in the room is complexion. Yep. And mm -hmm. you can talk around something like that, but when your back is against the wall, you're going to use whatever knife you have. And I think that that would be one. It is so interesting you, you say that because, of course, the other bone of contention was that saint George was an aristocrat and Mozart mm -hmm. wasn't. So, yeah. you know, it goes the other way too, although, you know, race probably would have trumped mm -hmm. the, the class in that instance. But that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of in the story, not in life. But that, that, the, the idea of, okay, there's class and then there's race, and the two don't always go the way that you would expect. Mm -hmm. They historically would expect them to go, and I think that's where why this would be such a compelling story, because you have these. It's like a fault line. You have these two yep. things yep. that don't necessarily yep. go together. So you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what would that dinner be like? It's interesting. I, I, for one thing, I would, I would imagine they would talk about. Uh, uh, being in the court of Marie Antoinette and her brother uh, Joseph Emperor of Habsburg and uh, and Austria and what it's like working for these two siblings. Um, I think that would sort of be interesting. I think that they would probably mention. I also think um, there's a there would be an, I would love to see uh, or I would I would love to imagine um, this this uh, the, the level of technicality and artistry that sort of would be that conversation. I think that would be terrific. Reminds me almost in some ways uh, a couple of years ago there was a film called One Night in Miami. Uh, yeah. About uh, you know uh, Cassius Clay and mm -hmm. Sam Cooke and uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and sort of the, the the way ideas can sort of permeate from one like thinking individual to another, or perhaps influence them, or um, or have a, a a back and forth that it affects history in a lot of ways. So I think that would be sort of a, a wonderful thing to watch them kind of talk about their their artistry and their music, and I would love to see sort of how one impacts the other. You know, negatively or positively, moving it forward, or just debating, you know, what the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of this or that uh, musical artistry. Marlon, that dinner. I don't think they would probably talk about music so much at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, I think they talk about the times that they were living in, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that these were very important times. Um, if they did talk about music, it would probably be how to actually reflect that in their music. And I, I, I really think that because in, in you know, Mozart, you know, you, if you, you know, write the letters and things like that, and the letters of great composers, they were very concerned with what's going to happen next. That's a fear of all musicians, is what's going to happen next. How are we going to live? How is our art going to survive? And I believe that they would be more concerned about that. Um, they wouldn't be, you know, of course, you know, that they say that, you know, Mozart was jealous of San George and he wrote, you know, the black character in the, in the magic flute, you know, these theories and things like that. But I think it, they would be more concerned with, because everybody shared their themes, their music, that wasn't a big deal uh, at the time. It's who, who wore it best, you know, or more so. But I think that they'd be more concerned about, like Beethoven, like <clears throat> what's Napoleon gonna do next? Are we gonna be at war with Poland? Uh, what's going to happen? What's gonna happen to my family? What's gonna happen to me? Am I gonna be able to survive as a composer? And that happened to Saint George actually, because when he, after the war, you know, he did not. It was not the same. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the same sponsorship. You didn't have anybody uh, interested in the time, and it was very much another barren place where you actually things were going to build up again to go to the next period. Yeah, and he actually was defeated in a match in London. Yeah. he was nearly fifty years old, but yes. you know that faded as well. Exactly. So With things, time, all things fade. Well, uh, what we hope does not fade is your interest in seeing the movie if you have not already. And for those who have seen it, I personally feel I would have loved to have seen it after this conversation because I, I feel so much more ready for it. But it is a really amazing window into the life of a genius, into the life of a decade, two decades of French history. Uh, it really, I, I think, will open up your curiosity to listen to the music and to read more about this incredible prodigy and accomplished artist. So to our three guests uh, and to you, let's thank them all for being here and for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, we have, some, we have some light refreshments in the lobby. Please join us and you can chat with our guests out there in the lobby. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure.